Good to see you all again. Um, my, Nora, uh, my youngest daughter, uh, she's six. Um, she loves to hide. Um, and I should clarify, she does love to play hide and seek, um, but that's not exactly what I mean or, or what she's really into right now. Uh, what she loves to do right now is hide from her big sister. And this hiding has now become a part of our bedtime uh, routine. And so each of our girls, of course, have their own bedtime routines at this point. Emily, uh, my oldest daughter, who's 10, loves to read. And so she goes as fast as she can through every step of the bedtime process so that she can finish before Nora and then run downstairs to read for a few more minutes. But Nora, on the other hand, uh, she can't quite move as fast with toothbrushing and, and all the other bedtime stuff. Um, so it takes her a little bit longer. Uh, but as soon as she's done, she very quickly uh, whispers to me, uh, her assistant, to put her pillows under her blankets in her bed so it looks like she's in bed under the covers. And it's actually evolved into a quick uh, command now. So it says, Daddy, do the pillow thing. And then as soon as she fires off the command, she runs off to hide somewhere in the house. And, and as soon as I fulfilled my pillow duties, um, I then have to start this difficult work of trying to coax Emily uh, to put down her book and come upstairs to bed. But uh, as soon as I've succeeded in that very strenuous task, um, she comes running up the stairs and she looks at me with a slight grin and, and strolls into her bedroom and, and dramatically rips off the covers of Nora's bed only to discover Nora's pillows underneath. Uh, and this of course prompts giggling and Emily belting out, Nora, where are you? As she runs off to figure out where she is in the house. And, and on some occasions, um, especially when she thinks she's got a really good hiding spot, uh, Nora reveals herself quickly because she starts cackling loudly with excitement. Uh, but other times, though, she stays as quiet as her little body will allow. Uh, and it's actually very challenging to find her because she's so small and she can tuck herself into all sorts of spots. But every time she hides, she always really wants to be found. She doesn't just want to be hiding indefinitely. And she loves this process of hiding uh, someone looking for her, seeking her out, and then eventually being found. And I couldn't help but think about this lovely tradition, this lovely routine, uh, as I've reflected on the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus that we're going to look at today that we just read. It's also a story of, of hide and seek in, a, in some ways. And it's a story of, of someone being found. And over the last few weeks, um, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Luke and, and noticing these different stories of Jesus eating with people. And in each of these stories, we've seen how Jesus teaches us extraordinary truths in these ordinary moments of life. And, and this week, we're going to once again find him teaching around the table. And as we explore this meal together, uh, we're going to see Jesus, we're going to see that he loves to find us. We're going to see that he loves to find people. And we're going to see that his life's mission is all about seeking and finding people. It's it's at the heart of why he came into the world. But even more than that, this morning we're gonna see what happens when Jesus seeks and finds someone. When Jesus seeks and when he finds someone, the result is a radical transformation. And so, so let's read this story again, uh, Luke uh, 19 verses one to 10. We're just gonna look, I'm just gonna read briefly the first couple of verses here before we jump in. He says in verse one, he entered, he being Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich, and, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he couldn't, so uh, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they being the crowd, they all grumbled. He's gone in to be with the guest of a man of, who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of all my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. And this story uh, really begins not with Jesus seeking someone, but with someone, a, a very like, unlikely someone, uh, seeking him out. 
And that's what we see here in the first five verses, a, a very unlikely person seeking Jesus. As Jesus is continuing his ministry and he and his disciples are, are working their way towards Jerusalem, uh, where he will ultimately sacrifice his life, um, he and his disciples are passing through a place called Jericho. And Jericho is really an interesting area. It's, it's a very affluent place. Uh, there's a lot of money there. And as, as I read about it this week, it sort of reminded me uh, some of, of, of the North Shore of Chicago. It's, it's sort of right on the outskirts of Jerusalem. Uh, it's a major tax center of the time. It has a ton of resources, uh, including uh, balsam trees, which, uh, which were all over the place, which they could sell and make a lot of money on, and of course, tax. And, and we're told that these balsam trees also made it smell really nice. So it was just a, kind of a, an oasis of a place that that was very affluent. And, and as they're passing through, uh, Luke tells us that there was a man there named Zacchaeus in the city who was seeking to see who Jesus was. And as we read it, nothing seems to be all that extraordinary. I mean, at Jesus at this point in his ministry, he's, he's been around for a while. He's causing all sorts of controversy. He's been healing people and, and claiming to be the Messiah and forgiving people. And, and so when Jesus comes to any town at this point, He's definitely going to draw a crowd. But Zacchaeus isn't just some ordinary religious person who's interested in, in the new traveling religious phenomenon here. Instead, he's the exact opposite. He's the most unlikely person here to want to seek Jesus out. And we're told that he was a chief tax collector. Uh, and as many of you already know, and probably we've already talked about, tax collectors were despised by their Jewish community. They partnered with the oppressive Roman government to, to squeeze out as much money as they could from their own people. And, and so the Roman government came up with this specific, uh, this tax, uh, this way of collecting taxes where they would, they would assign a specific amount of money that they wanted to receive from an area like Jericho here. And then they farmed it out to tax collectors who would be responsible to get that money from the community by creating and enforcing all those lovely things that we know as taxes. And so they would tax everything, and, and they would obviously get that money to give to Rome, but then they would also need to make a living, so, so they would double and sometimes triple the amounts uh, that they needed to receive in order to, to bring in a profit and, and to make themselves rich. And, and the system itself was corrupt, and it was uh, a system that had very little accountability and, and very few accountability structures, and so, of course, it became oppressive. Uh, these tax collectors, they were, they were Jewish sellouts. They were taking advantage of the situation for their own financial gain. And, and Zacchaeus here isn't just a tax collector, he's a chief tax collector. And so in their minds, he's the worst of the worst. He, he'd likely taken this idea of tax collecting to a whole nother level and, and became a sort of kingpin, setting up tax collectors under him that, that he'd then be able to collect from as well. And so he's probably the shrewdest of them all, and, and he may even have been the most violent of them all, and he's a chief tax collector. He's not someone who wastes his time with religion. He's successful. But not only was he a tax collector, we're also told that he was rich. Uh, he and his family probably had a very nice house. He probably had the best food and, and went to the best restaurants. If he had transportation, it was the nicest. He likely drove the BMW or the Lexus of the day. Whatever would have characterized his lifestyle, one thing is for certain, it was all was the result of his own hard work. He was self-sufficient. He didn't need anyone, especially the God of the hypocrites in his community. And so because of his job, uh, he was likely very, very much shunned or you know, uh, looked down upon from the religious community. He was an outcast. But it wasn't just the community that didn't like him. He also didn't like this religious community. In his mind, they were a bunch of hypocrites and fools. He didn't need them. He was self-made. He, he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps, and, and he made a prosperous life for himself without God or without religion. And so I imagine his life is similar to, to those I encounter a lot in the city. They're financially established. They don't appear to have any real needs uh, that, that, they, that they can't meet themselves. They have a lot of disposable income. They can travel where they want, and, and they can travel when they want. 
they frequent all the fun restaurants and they live and they travel and they, they play and they have fun in the city. They don't appear to need anything. And so it's very challenging for them to really see why they might actually need God or, or religion. And so that's why Jesus, when encountering a rich man a short time before this scene, says that it's actually easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When you see yourself as the primary provider of all of your needs, then it's hard to see where God fits in and, and why you might really need him. And so it's that kind of person that Zacchaeus is. He's self-sufficient. He's, he's someone for whom God seems irrelevant. And so it's a bit surprising when we're told that this person was seeking to see who Jesus was. This unlikely, corrupt, successful rich guy is seeking to figure out who Jesus is. He, he wants to get a glimpse of him. And so the question is, why? What is it that's motivating him to pursue Jesus? Uh, of course, there isn't a clear explanation in the text, but, but some have suggested that maybe it's simple curiosity. As we've already discussed, Jesus is proving to be an extraordinary figure, regardless of what you think about him. He's done spectacular things. He's healed people. He's uh, magically fed thousands of people by transforming a boy's Lunchable into food for everyone. He's even raised his friend Lazarus from the dead. So I imagine he's going viral. Everyone wants to watch his YouTube channel. Maybe it isn't just intrigue here, but, but maybe it's also a little bit deeper. Over time, Jesus has built up a reputation here for, for being the friend of tax collectors and sinners. He's become known for being anti-establishment, anti-religion, anti-Pharisees. And so in a lot of ways, he and Jesus share some of the same views. And so I wonder if he'd heard about Jesus from some of the others in his cohort, in his tax collector cohort. And, and maybe he heard from some of his trusted circle that this guy really was someone to consider and, and get to know. Maybe he'd heard strange stories that this guy wasn't like anyone else that they'd ever met, that he was genuine, and that he was authentic, and that he was full of grace and mercy. Or perhaps it wasn't just curiosity or, or intrigue, but, but maybe Zacchaeus was just tired of his life. Maybe he'd come to the end of himself. He'd worked hard to make a name for himself, and he worked tirelessly to be the best to be the most corrupt and wealthy person in his field. And, and maybe he was finally starting to awaken to the emptiness of his lifestyle. Maybe he'd finally met uh, you know, some of the big goals that he had set out for his life and, and he realized that they weren't as satisfying as he'd hoped. Maybe he discovered that what so many of us discover when we've worked so hard to achieve our dreams and, and we only get there to the end and to realize that the outcome wasn't as good as we anticipated. Or perhaps it's something deeper still. Perhaps it isn't simply his own seeking at all. Maybe there's something more supernatural and mysterious at work here. Maybe God's drawing him. Maybe it's, it's God who is gently nudging him in the power of his spirit. And, and maybe that's why Jesus says, I must eat with you today a few verses later. Well, whatever the reason, it's clear uh, that Zacchaeus has a strong desire to see him. His desire is made apparent by the drastic decision he makes in order to get a glimpse of him. We're told in verse 3 that because he was small in stature, he, he really wasn't able to see Jesus like he wanted while he was among the crowds. And so Zacchaeus, in his entrepreneurial way, uh, comes up with a better plan. Uh, instead of trying to fight the crowds, he, he runs up ahead and, and he climbs up into a sycamore tree, a tree that would have been very large and, and very full and also uh, fairly easy to climb. And so in some ways, it's a genius idea, but, but in other ways, especially in this context, it was an embarrassing and, and desperate thing to do. And if you were an adult and, and you were rich, especially, uh, you wouldn't be caught dead doing something as undignified and, and as childish as as climbing a tree. If you were searching for something uh, equivalent in our context, it would be like someone uh, climbing up into the rafters in a building in order to spy on a business meeting. If someone had seen him, uh, they would have no doubt mocked him or, or shamed him for his choice. 
what's Zacchaeus doing up in a tree? Well, many believe he was far enough up and, and the tree was full enough uh, that it would have been almost impossible for someone to see him. He's not trying here to be seen. He's just trying to see. He's not wanting to be discovered. He's just wanting to do some from a distance research. He's, he's very likely torn here. He, he wants to remain exactly how he is, but he also wants to, to hide and, and maybe just try to explore Jesus from a distance. I think there's, there's probably a part of him that, that really desperately wants to know and, and to be known by Jesus. But then there's this other part of him that really wants to stay hidden. And friends, I, I wonder if you can relate to, to Zacchaeus at all. I, I wonder if you find yourself hiding from God. We love to hide from him, don't we? It's a perennial problem. It's, it's something that we've been doing and we've been trying to hide from God uh, since the Garden of Eden. And there is a part of us that's scared. We're scared of what others will think. We're, we're scared of what will happen and, and we're scared of the consequences. But then another part of us, just like Zacchaeus, wants to be found. We want to finally be able to surrender to him. And, and so often we find ourselves in a position that requires us to make a risky decision. And, and so Zacchaeus finds himself in this position. And so he climbs a tree. Something deep inside of him wants to know Jesus and, and experience his love and kindness and acceptance. And so this unlikely person seeks after him. But this isn't just a story here of, of an unlikely person seeking after Jesus. We also see Jesus seeking after this very unlikely person. You see, we think we're seeing Zacchaeus, this curious tax collector, seeking after Jesus. But, but what we're going to discover is that we're actually and, and ultimately witnessing a story of Jesus seeking after Zacchaeus. Let's look again at verse 5. It says, And when Jesus came to the place... He looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. As, Je as Jesus is continuing to, to work his way through the crowd in, in Jericho, he gets to the place where Zacchaeus is hiding in a tree, and he's invisible to everyone. And I imagine he's walking, and the crowd is probably fairly loud, and there's a lot of upheaval, and the background noise is likely very distracting. But he gets to the bottom of this tree. And he stops abruptly. And when Zacchaeus, when, when Zacchaeus here sees Jesus and the crowd stop and, and begin to slowly look up, I'll bet his mind begins to race. He's probably kicking himself for making this foolish decision. He's, his thoughts are probably in overdrive as he thinks about all the possible outcomes. Is, is Jesus going to mock him? Or are the people going to point and laugh at him? He probably feels similar to how many of us feel when we make a decision that leaves us vulnerable to the opinions of others. Uh, when I was in high school, um, I had a crush on a girl I had met on a spring break trip. Uh, and I thought she was the best. And, and more importantly, I thought it was meant to be. And so when I returned home, I, I did what I thought was the most appropriate and essential next step. I wrote her a letter confessing my love. And as it turns out, uh, it was not meant to be because I never heard anything back from her again. Um, but what I did here uh, was the mocking and jeering of my ridiculous middle school friends when I uh, foolishly told them what I had done. And, and it was so embarrassing, especially when they started sharing it at school with other people and, and the word sort of spread. And I just always find it amazing, you know, even before social media, it's amazing how fast information like that can spread through a community. Um, and I imagine uh, Zacchaeus here is paralyzed with fear as he pictures how this tree scenario might turn out for him. He's fearing the words and the stares. He's, he suspects that his situation here might get posted on Facebook or YouTube and, and go viral. But Jesus here doesn't mock him or, or chide him for such an undignified and, and foolish behavior. Instead, he sees it for what it is, a divine appointment. And so he encourages him to come down and he says, hurry and come down. And then he does something equally strange. 
he invites himself over for dinner and, and for a sleepover. He says, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Isn't that a strange response? Doesn't that seem inappropriate? I mean, I know he's the savior of the world and all that stuff, but, but who invites themselves over and who invites their, themselves and their whole disciple crew over for a meal and to crash for the night? When I was in high school, I had a friend who um, was very eccentric. He was very quirky and, and he was a lot of fun in so many ways. And, and he was and still is um, a very kind and gentle soul. But, but one of the things he would do is he would just show up at my house unannounced. Uh, but it wasn't just that he would show up without calling. He would, he would show up at one or two in the morning and we'd often be in bed and we'd hear this knock and it was just strange and awkward and, and a little bit inappropriate. And, and he certainly didn't mean to be rude, uh, but his behavior here, it broke all the rules of what was acceptable. And, and as we read this story, it almost seems like this is what Jesus is doing here. But in fact, uh, he's doing something that's so much better. Uh, he's not simply uh, rudely inviting himself over. He isn't just saying, oh, I, I must eat with you today. I, I don't have any food and, and I don't have any lunch plans, so I'm, I'm crashing at your house. There's something much more mysterious going on here. And we get a hint of this mystery when we hear Jesus first call him by name. At this point, he's just entering the town and, and he hasn't even had a chance to settle in, but he somehow already knows Zacchaeus, this person who wants to know him. And he's demonstrating for us and, and for him that he has a supernatural divine knowledge. But it isn't just a demonstration of divine knowledge. Jesus says, come down, Zacchaeus, because I must stay at your house. This is what some scholars have called a divine must. It's a declaration indicating that this situation has been ordained by God. Jesus is saying, I must come. Uh, this is all a part of the divine plan. It's, it's the same divine must that Jesus refers to in chapter two of Luke when he says, I must be about my father's business. And it's the same divine must that he's talking about in chapter four when he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom. And it's the same divine must that he's referencing when he says in chapters nine and 11 or nine and 17, uh, that he must suffer and die. There is a divine orchestration happening here. And friends, this is how our God works. In some mysterious and miraculous ways, even when we think we're seeking him, he is the one who's seeking and drawing us. And this is good news for us. This means that we don't have to worry about whether we're going to miss out on God's calling. Uh, we don't have to worry about whether we're going to mess up God's plan. He is the sovereign one who is in control, and nothing is a surprise to him. And so Zacchaeus has just stepped into a mysteriously divine moment. And the amazing thing here is that I think he actually realizes it. And this is why he responds the way that he does in verse 6. He doesn't freeze up. He doesn't pretend to blend in or, or to try to hide behind a branch. We're told that he hurried down and and he came down and he received him joyfully. He's not scared at all. And instead, he's relieved and he's filled with joy. I think that even while Zacchaeus was hiding, deep down, he really wanted to be found. And so he eagerly and quickly responds to Jesus' invitation. And this divine must changes his life forever. And indeed, we witness here a camel walking through the eye of a needle because what is impossible with man is possible with God. And you really do have to sit back and appreciate this moment. You know, Jesus here, he knows how his life is going to turn out. He knows, and he has already shared with his disciples that he must suffer and die. And that's where he's heading very soon. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's on his way to give his life as a sacrifice. But before he does so, he also must stop and embrace and pour out his love on this chief tax collector. If I were en route to my demise, I got to be honest, I, I would be a little distracted. 
But I'd also probably switch gears here from this individual invite approach that Jesus always seems to take to, to full-on revival preacher. Now, I'd very likely start thinking in terms of quantity uh, and, and trying to share the gospel with as many people as I could. But Jesus here is focused on the one. He's focused on each of us individually, regardless of how bad we are and, and regardless of where he's headed. And friends, this is who Jesus really is. He doesn't just care for the whole world in some abstract way, like, like how we talk about we love people. Instead, he shows us that his love is so personal. Of course, it's corporate, but, but he reaches each of us right where we are on an individual level. And he's never afraid to get himself dirty. He, he knew this invitation to Zacchaeus would, wouldn't have pleased the crowd. It would have upset them or it wouldn't have met their expectations. They would have imagined him dining with a Pharisee or, or maybe a chief priest, but not a chief tax collector. And so what do they do? They, they grumble in their most condemnatory way. Oh, look, they say, he's, he's gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Of course he did. That's exactly who he came for. Jesus declares in verse 10 exactly why he came, just in case we and just in case they weren't clear. He says, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Friends, if you feel lost and, and if you've been hiding from God, be encouraged. God is drawing you to himself. He's seeking you. That's his mission. That's, that's his life purpose. And we don't just see here an unlikely man seeking Jesus and, and Jesus seeking an unlikely man. We also see the results of this encounter. Zacchaeus experiences a dramatic change. He's completely transformed. He experiences an emotional transformation. This man who, who once was probably very miserable, who was probably very grumpy and, and sad and hopeless, is now joyful as he welcomes Jesus into his home. He, he probably experienced what many of us have experienced when we met Jesus, an inexpressible joy. For the first time in a long time, and maybe forever, he's probably happy. And Zacchaeus experiences a social transformation. Now he seems to be concerned about making things right with those in his community. Look at verse eight, it says, and Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, behold, Lord, Half of all my goods I give to the poor, and, and if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'm going to restore it fourfold. After being with Jesus, we're, we're told he stands and declares that he's going to get right with those in his community. He, the ones he's defrauded, the ones he's taken advantage of, he's going to right the wrongs in his relationships. And we see a spiritual transformation. This chief sinner now sits with Jesus and and calls him Lord. He surrendered his life to him, and, and no doubt he sees him as the Son of God, as the long-awaited Messiah. And we see a transformation of his convictions. Now he cares about justice, and, and he cares about meeting the needs of the poor, and, and he's filled with generosity. This person who was only concerned about himself is now filled with generosity and, and filled with with wanting to use his resources in a different way. And what an amazing picture of transformation. Indeed, one scholar notes that Zacchaeus' salvation has personal, domestic, social, and even economic dimensions to it. It's holistic. This isn't just a spiritual change. This is what happens when you encounter Jesus. When you're found by him, when he seeks and saves you, you're completely transformed. And so often I think we get confused with this, don't we? We, we expect people to act a certain way or, or to make certain decisions first, uh, but, but, our, but our goal is never to enforce a code. Instead, our goal should be to bring salvation to the house. And then once that happens, then this life transformation will follow. It's always a response to God's grace. It's always the natural outflow of a heart changed by Jesus. And one of my favorite aspects of this story is how it demonstrates for us 
the way in which God breaks into our life. At times, he indirectly draws us through the power of the Spirit in our inner being. He, he creates in us a longing and, and a desire that we would otherwise never have. But then at other times, he, he directly and clearly calls out to us. He encourages us to come to him and, and to be in relationship with him, both indirectly and directly. And so, friends, I wonder today how you sense God is working in your life. Maybe like Zacchaeus, you are experiencing internal longings to know him and to be closer to him. I would just encourage you to pay attention and, and to put yourself in a position, just like Zacchaeus did, to hear those longings. Use the scripture and, and use prayer to help you guide and, and to clarify those longings. And God will direct your paths and, and God will transform your life, just like he did Zacchaeus. Or maybe like Zacchaeus, others of you have heard the words and commands of Jesus directly. Maybe through a sermon or, or through scripture reading, he's calling you to himself or, or, or calling you to make a big decision. Similarly, I'd encourage you to respond like Zacchaeus, quickly and joyfully. And when you do, you'll also experience the life change that we all want. Or maybe others of you are, are in a place similar to the crowd who who wanted Jesus to act in a certain way, but he didn't. He disappointed you, and it's confusing. And so I want to encourage you to consider God's divine musts. He's beautifully orchestrating this whole world, and, and it's going exactly how he has planned. And, and he's promised that this plan is for our good. And so lean into the truth and the beauty of God's sovereignty this morning. He isn't a God who is blindly... Uh, or recklessly orchestrating it. He's a God who is lovingly doing all that he can to seek and to save the lost, even when we're trying to hide from him or, or feeling disappointed by him, he's calling out to us. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you are a God who seeks and saves the lost, that, that you meet us even when we're hiding. And so I pray for us today, God, I pray that you would reveal to us where we might be hiding from you and that you would allow us and you would give us the courage and the boldness uh, to put ourselves in a position to hear from you. I pray you would change us today, that you would make us more like you. And I pray the story of Zacchaeus, God, that it would be imprinted on our minds and our hearts and it would remind us of how much you love us, God. In Jesus' name.